All right, well, let's go and get started. I, I'm really glad to have Chris Thornham here today. Um, he may have an introduction for himself. A little uh, one. Huh? <laughs> a little one, but you do your thing. But I, I'll just say, I didn't plan any of this, this introduction to myself earlier on, but I think there's some things you should know about Chris. First of all, we used to be, uh, we used to be engineers together the same company long ago. And uh, when I started off, I graduated, started working in the water wastewater in industry. He and his brother were mechanical engineering grads, and they, we hired them to come join our team. Um, we just spent a lot of time in this cubicle world doing a lot of design. <laughs> and because they came from the mechanical side, there's a lot of 3D design that we thought we would like to do. And so he and his brother just did a lot of that. Meanwhile, I got him addicted to Harry Potter books uh, <laughs> because I thought, hey, you can sit at a computer, you might as well listen to a good book. Yep. It's a key ingredient to happiness in a cubicle world of you know, <laughs> consulting engineering. That's true. Um, both of us exited the company at around the same time. There's a downturn in the economy. Perhaps you heard of the Great Recession. Um, he went on to start a business. I went on to start my PhD. And, uh, you know, ever since then, ever since starting really the engineering leadership program, I thought, yeah, I wonder what Chris and John are up to. <laughs> and uh, not too long ago, uh, you'd exited that company. I did. And uh, caught you at a good time. And I was like, hey, maybe we should do something here. So I had, yeah, I interviewed him for a SoCal Celebrates Entrepreneurship event back in November 21. The videos are on YouTube if you want to go see that interview. Um, and so there's a whole host of videos of different, with different entrepreneurs and different venture capitalists and people who are involved with that um, that you can see there. And then I thought, well, we need to have you in person since you're only in San Diego. Yep. We can pay for gas. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to buy you lunch. And, uh, yeah. that, should, that should be enough to entice a person to come up, right? Yeah. So that is the intro that i should tell you that i wanted to tell you about for chris and in that regard i'm going to turn the time over to you now and let you take the rest thank you sir <laughs> all right well i'm honored to be here uh as he said we worked together about 15 years ago designing water and wastewater systems uh, since that time i went on to start my first company which failed uh, my second company we designed carbon fiber uh, race wheels for road bikes and triathlon bikes and that company was actually a big success uh, and then I sold my shares in that company at the end of 2019. And since that time, I've been reading and writing about uh, decision making, habits, human behavior, and all kinds of things like that. I post all of that information on christhornham.com. And I've even built a, a meditation app that combines meditation with self improvement. And I call it Aware, A W A I R. And you can get that on iOS and Android. So about a year ago, like you said, Dr. Lamb and I reconnected and I did a speech with him at the uh, Entrepreneur Conference. And he said it would be a good idea for me to come here today to talk to you about decision making and some of the things that I've learned. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about how you can make good decisions that ultimately can improve your life. All right, so I'm going to start with a story that will set the context for what we're going to talk about today. Um, and in November of 2004, a 69-year-old patient died at Virginia Mason Hospital because they were accidentally injected with an antiseptic. So the reason this mistake was made was because there were three containers of clear liquid inside their room, inside the patient's room, and all of them were unlabeled. Now you might think this is a freak accident, but it's surprisingly common. So in fact, 10% of all deaths in the United States are caused by preventable medical errors which makes preventable medical errors the third leading cause of death in the United States. So after this death, the management at Virginia Mason realized that they needed to make some changes, and they attempted to do that with two main ideas. So the first idea was studying failure, and what they realized is that doctors were afraid of admitting the mistakes because they didn't want to lose their jobs, they didn't want to ruin their reputation, or they didn't want to get sued. Um, but what happens when you hide the mistakes of individuals is the group doesn't get to learn the lesson from those mistakes. So what they did is instead of punishing doctors, uh, they encouraged staff to come forward, talk about what they did, and then document what happened. And that gave management the opportunity to learn from the inefficiencies. So the second idea is they implemented the philosophy of marginal gains, which is the idea that you can make large changes through a series of many small changes. 
Um, so what they did is they took the lessons inside of each accident report and they started making changes inside of the hospital. So here's a few of the things that they did. Uh, they updated the drug labels so that they were easy to read in high pressure situations. They changed their patient wristband system from a, a purely color system to a color and text system so that colorblind staff could easily identify things that needed to be identified with patients. They added operating room checklist to streamline procedures inside of operating rooms. They improved the ergonomics of specific surgical tools. And they optimized the layouts of the departments so staff had to take fewer steps throughout the day. So some of these changes led to nurses having to walk 750 miles less each day as a, as a group. That saved nurses 250 hours per day. They reduced the time it took to set up surgical instruments inside of an operating room from 19 minutes to 10 seconds, which is pretty amazing. And they reduced the operating room turnover time from 68 minutes to 10 minutes. So overall, these changes led to some pretty big results. And those, that meant nurses were able to spend 60% more time at patients' bedsides, 74% um, reduction in liability claims, and Virginia Mason is now considered one of the safest hospitals in the world. So the reason I'm telling you this story is because it supports two of the main ideas that I want you to take away from today's presentation. And the first idea is that all decisions affect your life, not just the big ones. So most of us know that the big decisions in our life affect our lives. So where we go to college, what job we choose, or who we choose to marry would be examples of large, one-time decisions that have an immediate and obvious effect on your life. Um, and as you likely know, in general, better decisions lead to a better life. But what many people fail to recognize is that the small and seemingly insignificant decisions made consistently could add up to be just as powerful as the large decisions. So a classic example of this would be what you eat, right? So if you eat one piece of cake, that one piece of cake will have little to no effect on your life. But if you have a piece of cake with every meal for three years, that will have an effect on your life. So you can say the same thing about your financial decisions. All of your small financial decisions will add up to define your financial future. Just like what you do at work, all the small decisions will add up to define your future career. Um, so if you've been ignoring the small decisions in your life, you just need to realize how powerful these decisions can be. What's also important to recognize about the small decisions is some of them are conscious, which means you know that you're making them. But a lot of these small decisions that you're making are subconscious, which means you don't realize that you're making them. And if you're wondering how big of an effect these subconscious decisions could be having on your life, a study by, by Cornell uh, just discovered that we make 226 decisions each day about food alone. So if you're anything like me, um, I certainly don't remember making 226 decisions about food. I decide what I want for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and maybe a few snacks. But what this means is there's a lot going on behind the scenes in our mind that is guiding our life and steering it in directions. So if we're making 226 decisions each day about food, um, it's safe to assume that we're making thousands of decisions each day that are affecting our lives. So the main point here is if you want to get the most out of life, you have to know how to make the big decisions well, but you also have to know how to make the small decisions well. Um, the second big takeaway that I want you to take away from this presentation today is that decisions are influ influenced by more than logic alone. So most of us think that decisions are purely logical, right? We have some options, we collect some data, and then we make a logical decision. But there's a lot more to decision making than just the logical side of it. And I think when you consider the story at Virginia Mason, this point becomes clear. And that's because in all the cases, the doctors were not only motivated to make logical, life-saving decisions, they were also highly trained to do so. But for some reason, they still made decisions that led to death. So the point here is pretty simple. If you wanna make good decisions, you have to understand all of the things that influence your decisions. And basically that's what this presentation is gonna be about. So we're gonna talk about three categories of things that influence you to make bad decisions. And then I'm gonna share some ideas that can help you make better decisions. Okay, so the first category is brain errors. So to start this section off, I want you to imagine that you're in a kitchen and you see a two-year-old about to reach for a stove. So in an instant, your eyes send a signal to your brain. Your brain registers that as a threat. 
It then calculates a plan, and then it coordinates all the muscles in your body to move at the perfect velocity and direction to save that child in the nick of time. So in order for this to happen, your brain and nervous system have to send information around your body at up to 268 miles an hour. And what this tells us is that your brain is incredibly powerful. But this is where a lot of people make their first mistake, and that's because they confuse powerful for perfect. But what's true is that your brain, as powerful as it is, it also makes mistakes. And it's these errors that can lead you to make poor decisions. So in this section, I want to talk about two specific brain errors that can cause you to make poor decisions. So the first one is what I call the logic switch. And in order to understand this, we have to go back in time. So to avoid the extinction list for millions of years, our brain had to become really great at two things. And those are thinking and responding to threats. And there are two systems inside of your brain that developed to make this possible. So the first system is your thinking brain. And this is the part of your brain that is responsible for all high level thought. So this allows you to plan, to process language, and then build complex objects like smartphones or iPads. Now the problem with all of this processing power is it comes at the expense of being slow, right? So it's, it's, it's smart, but it's slow. And unfortunately, the thinking brain is not fast enough to save your life in critical situations. So to put this into context, if our ancestors needed to take time to decide if running from a tiger was a good idea, well, then we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? Because they'd, they'd all be dead. Um, so this is where the second region of your brain comes in, and it's called the reacting brain. So this makes up for the thinking brain's lack of speed, and it's the part of your brain that regulates emotions, and it also allows you to make split-second decisions that keep you alive when faced with threats, like tigers or a two-year-old about to touch a stove. Now, the problem with the reacting brain is that its speed comes at the expense of logic, which is a fancy way of saying that your reacting brain is kind of dumb, okay? So to sum this up, you can consider the thinking brain to be smart but slow, and you can consider the reacting brain to be fast but dumb, all right? <laughs> so here's how all of this works. So environmental cues enter your body via the five senses, senses. So sight, touch, taste, smell, and hearing. Now, when these cues enter your body, they start in an area of your brain that's best described as a traffic director. It's not the actual term, it's just, it's a good example, okay? Now, if this cue is non-threatening, then your brain, the traffic director, sends that information to your thinking brain for logical processing, and then it sends it to your reacting brain for emotional processing. Um, but if the cue is threatening, then your brain has to keep you alive. So in order to save time, your the traffic director bypasses the thinking brain and sends the information directly to your reacting brain so that you can react in an instant without thinking. Now, what's important to understand here is that in addition to threats, strong emotions can also shut off this thinking part of your brain. So what that means is anytime you're overly angry or anxious or afraid, the thinking part of your brain is impaired and you're working primarily from your fast but dumb reacting brain. Okay, so what this tells us is that your brain basically has a smart state and a dumb state. And I think this is one of the most important things that you can learn about your brain. And that's because so many of life's problems are created when you make decisions with your dumb brain that you should be making with your smart brain. So to give you a few examples, this logic switch concept explains why people say something they don't mean in the middle of a heated argument. It explains why people might dump their life savings into a Ponzi scheme. And it might even explain why people who are infatuated get married after only a week of dating. So thankfully, the solution to this is relatively straightforward. All you have to do is just stop making decisions when your brain is in the dumb state, okay? <laughs> so you can do that with a two-step process. And basically what you have to do is you have to learn to identify when your thinking brain is turned off, and then you need to know how to turn it back on again, okay? So we're gonna start with step number one. So the first step is just to Identify when the logic switch is off. And as you've learned, strong emotions shut off the thinking part of your brain. So therefore, you can identify when your thinking is impaired by just learning to recognize strong emotions. And thankfully, your body makes this process pretty straightforward. And that's because strong emotions produce physiological symptoms inside of your body. So to give you a couple examples, if you're angry, you might clench your fists. 
you might feel a rush of energy or maybe even your heart pounding in your chest. Likewise, if you're anxious, you might feel, you might shake, you might feel, you know, have cold or clammy hands, or you might feel a pit in your stomach. So thankfully with practice, you can learn to pair these physiological symptoms with your emotions, right? So if you notice that your heart is pounding in your chest every time you feel angry, well then the next time you notice that symptom, then you can use that as a clue that you're probably not thinking clearly. Okay, so once you recognize that you have strong emotions and you're probably not thinking clearly, then you need to turn your thinking brain off, on again before you make a decision. And you can do that by waiting, and I'll explain why. So the reason that your thinking brain shuts off in the first place is because strong emotions elevate specific chemicals in your brain like adrenaline. And it's only when these chemicals return to their normal levels that the thinking brain turns back on again. And typically this process takes anywhere from six seconds to 20 minutes. So I'm gonna put all of this into some context and give you two examples. So imagine you're having a conversation with your spouse. Here it might be boyfriend or girlfriend, you take your pick. Um, so they say something that's upsetting and you feel a rush of anger. Well, if you listen to your dumb brain, then there's a good chance that you might react and say something that you, you later regret. But if you just take six seconds, you take a deep breath and you allow your thinking brain to turn back on again, then there's a much better chance that you're not going to say something stupid that you'll regret. To give you a second example, this would be something more severe. So let's say you're really upset because a coworker took credit for something that you've been working on for six months. Well, in a case like this, six seconds is not going to be long enough, right? You're going to need more time to calm down. So you might need 20 minutes. So in, in this type of situation, to increase your odds of making a good decision, you might go for a walk or even sleep on the problem before you address it the next day. So to summarize the logic switch, basically strong emotions shut off the thinking part of your brain. When the thinking part of your brain, the logic switch is off, you make poor decisions. Uh, in order to make better decisions, you have to turn the thinking part of your brain back on. And you can do that by waiting six seconds to 20 mi minutes for your emotions to calm down. So basically the point here is if you're overly emotional, don't make any important decisions. Okay. The second error, brain error, that I want to talk about are something called cognitive biases. And we're going to go back to evolution again to explain this. So your, our bodies evolved to be very energy efficient. And the reason that they did that is because the more efficient we became, the less food we needed, which increased our odds of survival, right? So because focused, complex thought uses a lot of energy, your brain likes to avoid this type of logical thinking whenever possible. So basically your brain likes to take the path of least resistance. And one way that your brain saves energy is by using something called cognitive biases. And I'm going to explain what cognitive biases are by giving you a practical example. So I want you to imagine that you're buying a toaster and you really want to get a good one. So in this case, it would be a huge waste of time if you spent, you did a competitive analysis on the top 10 or 20 toasters, right? That's a huge waste of time. A much better use of your time would be just to go to Amazon to find the toaster with 5,000 five-star reviews and then just buy that toaster. And if you make that decision, there's a really good chance that you're going to get a good toaster. Now this tendency that we have to buy items that are highly rated is actually called, is a cognitive bias and it's called the bandwagon effect. And it's our tendency to do something primarily because other people are doing it. Now in this example, the bandwagon effect is very helpful, right? Because it saves us a lot of time. But the bandwagon effect can also lead you to do harmful things. And a good example of that would be the 2008 housing crisis that Dr. Lamb actually <laughs> coincidentally mentioned at the beginning of this. Um, so a lot of people were getting mortgages that, that they couldn't afford. Everyone was buying houses and then everyone followed suit. And when the, the market collapsed, everyone was in big trouble, right? So you have to be careful with how these biases are influencing you. So believe it or not, um, Wikipedia lists over 100 cognitive biases, and all of these can lead you to make poor decisions like paying too much, um, staying in the wrong relationship, or even ignoring important information when you're making a decision. So your general goal with cognitive biases should be to prevent them from causing you to make poor decisions. And now this can be hard because most of these cognitive biases occur on a subconscious level. So we don't really know that they're affecting our decisions. But in my experience, I found two things can be very helpful for preventing cognitive biases, and those are education and forcing logic. I'm gonna explain how this works uh, by talking about something called the anchoring bias. 
So the anchoring bias is our tendency to let the first piece of information we receive influence our decisions. So I'm going to give you another example. I want you to imagine that you're shopping and you find an item that you want to buy and it's marked at $10. So you take this item, you go up to the cash register and the, and the clerk says that there's been an, a mistake. And she says, this is actually $100. Well, when you compare that $100 price to the first piece of information you received, the $10 number, that seems really high and it's unlikely that you're going to buy that item. Now in contrast, if you were shopping and you took the same item off the shelf and it was listed at $1,000 and you go up to the cash register and they say there's been a mistake, it's now $100. Well now that $100, it looks like a deal compared to that first piece of information, the anchor that you received. So it's going to be highly likely that you will buy the item. Now what's interesting with this example is that the, at the end of the day, you're offered the, you're given the exact same offer. So it's the same product for the same price of $100, but the first piece of information that you receive, the anchor, highly influences the decision that you make. And these types of influences are affecting your life on a daily basis. So knowing this, I'm gonna show you how education and forcing logic can help you to prevent cognitive biases. So the first step, like I said, is education. And basically that's what we just did, right? We learned about the anchoring bias. And the reason that this is important is because it's really hard to know how a bias is affecting you if you don't understand what it is. Um, so for this reason, just learning about biases in general, you just go through Wikipedia or there's a lot of good books on the topic. You can just read about some of these cognitive biases to understand how they're affecting your decisions. And then the next step is just to prevent yourself from making lazy, impulsive decisions or snap judgments um, because this is when biases tend to creep in. So if you're doing something and you can't really answer why you're doing it, there's a good chance that there's a bias affecting your decision. So you can prevent this problem when you recognize that's happening by forcing logic into the equation and you just do that by asking yourself relevant questions. So I'm going to give you an example to sum all this up. So I want you to imagine that you're buying a car and if you've ever done this, you'll know that car salesmen are trained to start with a really high anchor, right? So they start with a high price, and then every time they go out back, they talk to the manager and they come back with a much better price. Now, when you compare this new low price to the high price, it seems like a deal. And that's where most people decide to buy a car. But just because something feels like a deal or seems like a deal, it doesn't mean it is. Now, because you're aware of the anchoring bias, you don't have to fall into this trap. When you're aware that this is what car salesmen do, you can avoid this problem. So instead of simply just believing that this new price is a good price, you can force logic into the equation by asking yourself a practical question like, what's the market value of the car? And then the answer to that question will help you make a real, like a, a better good decision, okay? Um, so to summarize cognitive biases, basically your brain is inherently lazy and to save energy, your brain likes to avoid complex thinking by using cognitive biases. Sometimes these biases can lead you to do helpful things, but at other times it will lead you to do harmful things. And you can avoid biases by basically learning about how they affect your decisions and then forcing logic into the equation when you notice yourself making impulsive decisions. Okay, uh, so we're gonna move on to the second category of things that influence you to make bad decisions. And those are beliefs and emotions. I'm gonna tell you a personal story to start this one off. So when I was 33 years old, my girlfriend of eight years came home from work and told me that she was ending our relationship. In about a week, half the furniture was missing from my house, my bed was empty, and my companion was gone. Now, naturally, I started to feel pretty lonely, and when that feeling became overwhelming, I decided to talk with a therapist. I didn't know it at the time, but I got some bad advice. Essentially, what I was told was that I shouldn't feel lonely and that if I wanted to feel better, that I had to change how I thought about the situation so that I could change how I felt about it. So I read the books, I filled in the worksheets, and I tried all kinds of mental gymnastics, but I still felt lonely. And because none of these technique, techniques worked, I started to think that there was something wrong with me, and that led me to feel kind of depressed. So when I was tired of feeling miserable, I took matters into my own hands and I read a book called Loneliness and that book really changed everything. Essentially what it taught me is that we evolved to feel emotions like loneliness for very important reasons and that given my situation, it was perfectly normal to feel lonely. So these insights helped me realize that there was nothing wrong with me and instantly that helped me start to feel better. 
Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I still struggled, but ultimately this entire experience taught me two important things about decision making and they helped me turn my life around. So I'm going to share those with you now. The first lesson that I learned is that you should question your beliefs. And there's a very specific reason why this lesson is important. So here's what that is. Every decision you make is based on a prediction that is influenced by your beliefs. Now I know that is a mouthful, okay? So I'm going to give you an example to explain what I mean by this. So if you believe that the police watch a particular stretch of highway, then that belief will cause you to predict that speeding will lead to a ticket, and that prediction will cause you to make the decision to slow down, okay? So if you have rational beliefs, then this belief prediction decision pattern works in your favor. And that's because rational beliefs lead to helpful predictions and behaviors. So I want you to imagine that there's a young girl in math class and she's struggling, she's falling behind. So if she has the rational belief that hard work pays off, then that belief is helpful because it influence, influences her to study. Now in contrast, if you have irrational beliefs, then this belief prediction decision pattern works against you. And that's because irrational beliefs lead to harmful predictions and behaviors. So if this young girl is falling behind in math class and she has the irrational beliefs, belief that all girls are bad at math, then that belief will be harmful because it influences her to give up, okay? So in my case, I believed it was wrong to feel lonely and that belief caused me to predict that I wouldn't feel better until I stopped feeling lonely. As a result, I decided to spend all of my time trying to control my emotions, right? And because it's impossible to control your emotions, I got nowhere. So it was only when I changed my beliefs that I was able to actually improve my situation. So once I believed that it was normal or okay to feel lonely, that allowed me to predict that my life would get better when I met somebody. And that allowed me to, and that influenced me to do things that would actually improve my life, like going on dates and being social. So the main point I'm making here is that your beliefs will heavily influence your decisions. And if, if you have irrational beliefs, like I'll never be successful or I'm a loser, then those beliefs will have a negative impact on your life. So the good news here is that it is possible to change your beliefs. And there are many ways that you can do this, but I'm going to share one idea that I think is very effective. And that is to just simply ask yourself if your beliefs are supported by fact or logic, right? So most rational beliefs are supported by fact and logic and most irrational beliefs are not. So if we go back to the example of the girl in the math class, um, there's really no evidence that supports the idea that girls can't be good at math. But in contrast, there's a lot of evidence that supports girls can be good at math. So the main point I'm making here is, it, is if you realize that your beliefs are irrational, then that's harmful because they're going to predict, they're going to cause you to make poor decisions. So in a case like this, you'll benefit from forming more rational beliefs because that will lead to better predictions and decisions. Okay. The second lesson that I learned from my time being lonely is that you should avoid negative peer pressure from your emotions. So in general, we tend to think of as negative emotions as wrong or bad because they don't feel good, right? But that's not true. What is true is that we've evolved to feel a whole host of emotions, both good and bad, because they help us survive. So to give you a few examples, um, fear lets us know when we're in danger. Loneliness encourages you to return to the group where your odds of survival are greater. And jealousy lets you know that an important relationship may be at risk. So with this idea in mind, I think it's helpful to stop thinking of emotions as either good or bad, and instead think of emotions as something like a check engine light in your car that indicate that something needs your attention, right? So if you're feeling nervous before a presentation, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Instead, it's just a reminder that what you're doing is important and it needs your focus. Likewise, if you feel anxious every day, that's not enjoyable, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. It's just a reminder that you probably need to work on your mental health. So the reason that this distinction is important is because people often think that they believe they have to listen to their emotions, right? So if they feel angry, they think they have to act angry. If they feel anxious, they think they have to act anxious. Or if they feel lonely, they think they have to act lonely. 
Now, in some cases, this influence from your emotions is helpful. So if somebody points a gun at you in a dark alley and you feel influenced to run, then fear is really, really helpful. But fear can also be harmful if it prevents you from asking for a date or a raise. Likewise, anger can, incur can influence you to protect your children, but it can also influence you to yell at your boss. So ultimately, what I'm saying here is how you respond to your emotions is your choice. So if your emotions are telling you to do something helpful, like run away from a gun, then by all means, listen to your emotions. But if your emotions are influencing, influencing you to do something harmful, like punch your boss, right? You don't have to listen to your emotions. Instead, you can choose a better behavior. So I know that punching your boss is an extreme example, but the point here is that if you're not careful, your emotions can influence you to do lots of different harmful things. Um, so basically, what I'm saying is you don't have to let your emotions control your life. And the reason for that is because you can choose positive actions despite how you feel, right? Now, this won't always be easy, but if you let your emotions run your life, then you almost guarantee failure. But in contrast, if you learn to take positive actions despite how you feel, then you can keep your life on track even at the worst of times. And I think that there's a pretty famous story that illustrates this whole idea well. So during the buildup to the 2012 Olympic Games, this is what Michael Phelps had to say about swimming. So he said, after 08, mentally I was over. I didn't want to do it anymore, but I also knew I couldn't stop. So I forced myself to do something that I really didn't want to do, which was continue swimming. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should spend your entire life doing things that you don't want to do, but what I am saying is that it can be beneficial to make decisions that make you feel uncomfortable. So in Phelps' case, deciding to swim, even though he didn't want to, allowed him to become the most decorated Olympian in history. But on a more fundamental level, if you decide to follow your dreams despite a fear of failure, that could be the difference between a meaningful career, or sorry, a meaningless career, and a fulfilling career. If you decide to ask for a date despite a, a fear of rejection, that could be the difference between spending your life alone or building a family of your own. And if you feel depressed, then asking for help despite feeling embarrassed could be the difference between suicide or living a meaningful life. Now, to relate this back to the story I told at the beginning of this section, in my case, feeling depressed influenced me to stay home alone. But instead, I decided to make the type of decisions that would help me build a life I wanted despite how I felt. So in my case, that meant exercising when I didn't feel like it. It meant calling a friend when I wanted to stay home alone. And it meant staying open and optimistic towards dating, even when the entire process felt hopeless. Here's how you can apply this idea to your life. So whenever you feel like strong emotions are influencing your decisions, I just want you to ask yourself a simple question. And that is, is this decision improving my life and the lives of those around me? Now, if the answer to that question is yes, then that's a good indication to keep doing what you're doing. But if the answer to that question is no, then it's probably time to rethink your decisions. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the third category of things that influence you to make poor decisions, and that's information and failure. I'm gonna start with another quick story. Um, in 1899, two brothers set out to build the world's first self-powered aircraft. Uh, in the beginning, these guys knew nothing about flight. So for the next four years, they studied the flight of birds, they conducted thousands of experiments that failed, and they crashed dozens of kites, gliders, and airplanes. Um, but this is a success story, and as most of those go, these guys never gave up. They took one lesson from each failure, and eventually they made history in 1903 by flying the world's first self-powered aircraft, and these were the Wright brothers, okay? So most people know this story, uh, but the reason I'm telling you this story is because it illustrates what effective decision-making looks like over a long period of time. So a lot of people think that in order to make a good decision, you have to be right. But that's not always true. And as you've seen with the, with the Wright brothers, um, they made uh, thousands of wrong decisions. But all of those wrong decisions, decisions added up to make one big right decision. And the reason that this point is important is because if you let a fear of failure prevent you from making a decision altogether, um, you basically stall. You stop making progress. So to give you another example, um, my first business failed. And if you see this marketing strategy, I'm pretty sure <laughs> you can see why. 
Um, we really had no idea what we were doing, but we learned a lot in the process, okay? But after this business failed and I started my second business, I was so afraid of failing for a second time that I spent months weighing the pros and cons of every idea and every option. And ultimately, because I never made a decision, I never got anywhere. So when I was completely frustrated with not getting anywhere, I asked to speak with a successful entrepreneur and I asked him if he ever got stuck trying to make a decision. And he quickly said no. And ultimately what he taught me is that not making a decision is far worse than making the wrong decision because you stop making progress. However, if you make the wrong decision, at least you learn something that you can use moving forward to make a better future decision. So the big takeaway here is that at any point in your life, at any time, you have a given amount of information. And if you want to move your life forward in a positive direction, you have to make the best decision you can with the information that you have. Now, if you make the wrong decision, it's not a big deal, right? You can just learn and move on. So in general, the more information that you have, that will lead to a better decision. But I say that with a giant asterisk, and that's because there are basically two techniques that you can use to acquire information. And those are education and experimentation. So I'm going to explain what those are now. So I want you to imagine that you get your first professional camera, right? So it's the, it's the kind of camera that has a hundred different dials and settings. So you take your first picture and it doesn't turn out that well. Well, the only way that you can take a better picture moving forward is by learning something about the camera or photography in general. And like I said, there are basically two ways that you can do that. So the first is through education. So you might read the instruction manual, you might take a photography course or watch a how-to video. And the second would be through experimentation. So you might take a picture, you might change a setting on the camera, see what effect that had and decide if that's better or worse. Now, if you get stuck in the education phase, so you're only reading about photography, you're only watching videos, but you're never actually taking a picture, then you're not becoming a better photographer. And likewise, if you're only experimenting, but you're never reading the instruction manual or you don't learn the basics of photography, then it's highly unlikely that you're gonna become a great photographer. So really what you want here is a mixture of the two. You wanna get some basic level of education, then you wanna take what you've learned and go experiment. And eventually you're gonna hit a wall, you're gonna say, oh, I need some more education, then you're gonna go back to experimentation and that cycle just repeats itself over and over again. So to sum this section up, uh, here's how you can use information and failure to make better decisions. So the first thing you wanna do is accept that you will never be right 100% of the time. And the reason you wanna do this is, is because it ensures that a fear of failure won't keep you stuck in place. After that, you're gonna to wanna to educate yourself. So learn the basics, talk to experts, take courses, do what you have to do. Next, you're gonna to wanna to filter your information because as you're educating yourself, you're gonna realize that some information that you're collecting is useful and some of it's not. And a lot of people get stuck in clutter. They have all this information and they can't make a good decision because they have too much information. So quickly learn to identify what's helpful and what's not. Hold on to what's helpful, get rid of what's not. And then finally, um, you're just gonna to wanna to experiment. And this is where you make the best decision that you can with the information that you have. And like I said, if you make the right decision, that's great. But if you don't, just take what you learn and use that to make a better decision. Um, so before I go, uh, I wanna leave you with one final idea. Um, about 20 years ago, I was in university just like you. And when I was making this presentation, I asked myself what I wish somebody would have told me back then. And I think it's this. I used to think that big accomplishments like starting your own company or you know, learning how to be a computer programmer required you to know a secret or have some type of special skill. And so for years, I didn't chase specific dreams because I didn't think that they were possible for me to achieve. But if I've learned anything in my 15 years of being an entrepreneur, it's that you achieve almost anything through a series of small decisions. So thankfully, after I graduated, I decided to change my beliefs about what it took to be successful. Um, and since then, I've taught myself how to build companies. I've learned how to market and sell. I've learned how to build websites and mobile apps. And I've even taught myself to film, edit, and produce videos. And in this process, basically what I've learned is that there's no secret to success, right? Um, all you have to do is just make the decision to continually keep learning and moving forward. 
So with this idea in mind, I want to encourage you, I really want to encourage you when you leave here today, to think about what you want from life in the next five, 10, or 20 years. Because I think once you know what you want from life, you can use this following idea, and I think it's very powerful. So at any given point in your life, you basically have a decision to make. Any moment in your life, you have this decision to make. You can make a decision that takes you towards the life you want, or you can make a decision that takes you away from the life you want. And to give you an example, if you want to start your own company, right, you can spend your free time playing video games and you'll get nowhere, or you can spend your free time learning the skills that it takes to become a successful entrepreneur. Now, these things don't happen overnight, but if you're consistent and you stick with your goals, then eventually they'll, they'll come, you know, you'll get there. Um, so in saying this, I just want to be sure that I'm not trying to make you feel like you're left your life is a never-ending, stressful decision, right? But I promise you, your decisions add up. And even though it may not feel like it at your age, I promise you in the next 5, 10, 20 years, you'll start to notice that it becomes apparent that the people who choose to focus on improving their life get ahead. And it's just something that eventually adds up. So when you leave here today, just try to remember to continually check in with yourself and ask. Ask this question. And that is, if I continue to make the same decisions that I've been making, um, will that take me towards the life I want to live? And if the answer to that question is no, then I think you need to rethink your decisions. But if the answer to that question is yes, then that's a pretty good indication that you're making good decisions. And that's it. So thank you. <laughs> I will be here for as many questions as you want. Sure. Yeah, so I think that there's, there's a, that's a good distinction. So the, the first one, the logic switch, is when your emotions are ramped up really, really high, right? It's, it's kind of like the, the fight or flight response. It's a very similar response. It's basically the same response. So in a situation like that, it's almost impossible to think logically because that part of your brain is actually shut off, right? The next, I also talked about emotions over a broader range, right? So if you feel sad or depressed over a very long period of time, or you don't feel good about yourself over a very long period of time, then those emotions can influence you to make more mild decisions gradually over a long period of time. So I've read a lot about these things over the last few years, and I think for the people who become successful, right, people who start companies or have a successful relationship, whatever you want it to be, I think at a fundamental level, people have to have some sense of self-control, right? They have to be, they have to know how to manage their emotions effectively. They have to believe in themselves enough to put effort in and believe that it will pay off, right? A lot of people who never get anywhere who, or who aren't successful just have so many horrible thoughts about themselves. Like they never start, they never do it, they never believe in themselves. So the, the logic switch part, which I mentioned, is like spur of the moment. Your kid's in danger. You're just, you react, right? And that's when you make poor decisions. But I also think that there, there's a level of just believing yourself and having a positive mental health that comes into success in, in almost all areas of life. And that applies to entrepreneurship. Like if you, if you sit down to build a company and the whole time you're thinking, I'm a loser, I can never do this, I suck, you're never going to start a company, right? Eventually you have to believe in yourself. You have to say, look, this is hard. I don't know everything, but I have the ability to learn and I can apply myself and hard work pays off and I'm going to get stuck and that's okay. And I'm going to fail and I'm going to make mistakes, but I can keep going and I can ask questions and I can look for answers, right? That's the key, I think, to success, not only in entrepreneurship, but almost all areas of life. So I would say that how you present yourself to the world is how they're going to they interpret you. If I came in here today and I gave a presentation and I was very quiet and I looked at the floor and I didn't engage with you and I was very meek and mild, you probably wouldn't believe anything I said, right? It would be a very awkward conversation. But over 15 years of doing this and going to school and being like, I'm confident about what I've done and what I do. So I try to bring confidence to this room, right? So I think, I don't know, but I'm guessing you didn't think this was a terrible presentation, so I brought some confidence to the room. If you show up to a group of people and you want to be an entrepreneur and you're quiet and you're meek and you, you don't believe in yourself, you don't believe in your ideas, you don't share any ideas, nobody's going to want to work with you. But 
if you have some confidence and you just go in and there's, there's a lot of confidence too in, in humility. I'm here to learn. I don't know everything, but I, I'm excited and I want to apply myself, right? You don't have to have all the answers. So if you go in thinking, I don't have the answers and I'm not good enough, you're going to get nowhere because people are going to pick up on that. But if you go in and say, I don't have the answers, but I'm willing to work and I'll do whatever it takes. How can I help you? That's going to have a much better effect on how people receive you in general. Sure. So the first thing I'll tell you is that everybody has self-doubt. Self -doubt. Everybody. Even the most successful people in the world doubt themselves, right? They might not appear like they do, but behind the scenes, people have doubt. I, I've started companies. I sold my first one. I didn't need to get a job right away. I've been successful, right? In starting these next two companies that I've talked about today, I had self-doubt all the time. I mean, I would work days on end. I would go to my wife. I'd be like, oh, I don't, what am I doing? This is not going to work. But I think the point is, is you just keep going. So when I said that you take positive action despite how you feel, right? That's what successful people do. They have self-doubt, which is okay, but they don't let that self-doubt just cause them to quit or give up. They keep going despite how they feel. The second thing I will say to you is that confidence or self-esteem, you can't give that to somebody, right? I can't tell you how to be confident. And that's because confidence and self-esteem are earned, right? If you don't feel confident doing a job that you've never done, that's a very normal response to something you've never done because you've never done it. You become confident at your job by doing the job and getting experience. To give you an example, if I asked you to brush your teeth today, do you feel nervous about doing that? No, because you've done it thousands of times, right? You've earned the confidence to do that effectively. So if you're going to go to a job and it's the first day on the job, you're not going to be that confident. You're going to be, you're going to be scared. But in time, once you show up, you show up for six months, you show up for a year, you learn the skills, you learn the tools, you become confident over time. How many years have you been coming to this school? Four years. Would you say that you feel more confident walking the hallways today than you did on your first day? Right. So what I'm saying here is that you're going to feel unconfident. You're going to lack self-esteem. You're going to have self-doubt all the time in your life. But eventually, you just have to earn that confidence. And it takes time, right? It takes experience. So don't let, don't, don't say to yourself, I'm unconfident. I don't have self-esteem. Nobody does. Like, you don't just, you're not born with it, right? And like, nobody just gets it. Eventually, you just have to earn it. So stop labeling yourself as, I'm not this, I'm not that. Just go, okay, it's normal. It's normal for me to feel this way. And that's why I was saying, like, when I was told, it, I, you know, I shouldn't feel lonely. I was like, wow, something's wrong with me. And that just made me, like, clam up and I got depressed and I never went on dates and it was horrible. Like, of course I felt lonely. I was doing everything a lonely person does. But if you're not confident and you just say, oh, I'm not confident, I can never do this, and I can never talk to anyone, and I don't want to make eye contact, you're never going to be confident, right? So, and this is normal. Like, I, I'm not being hard on you. Everyone in this room deals with that. Every one of us. So I think the important thing for you to recognize is that it's 100% normal for you to feel afraid or unconfident or to doubt yourself. But you have a decision to make. And that is, do you want to choose to make decisions that improve your life. And it's not going to be easy, but you can do it. And if you don't, you're going to just stay stuck where you are. Does that make sense? You have another question? I'm you're processing. Good. That's good. <laughs>
I mean, I'm married, right? Husbands and wife have, have disagreements. At times, like if, if we're talking about something and I, my wife's getting upset or I'm getting upset, sometimes I'm like, look, let's just take a minute. And five minutes later, it's completely logical and it makes sense, right? But sometimes when you're really frustrated and you're upset, you just you can't think straight, right? So if you're with somebody and you notice them, you know, kind of getting upset or going too far, give them a break. You know, maybe it makes sense to talk about it tomorrow or whatever. Um, yeah, so that's that's would be my first piece of advice. Is there any specific situation that you're you're saying? No, just, just in general. general yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, just use that. You know, the biology of it. Let them calm down and try not to escalate it for sure. Again, it goes back to taking positive action despite how you feel, right? I failed in the past. The first business I had failed. And if I would have said, I'm a failure in business, I will never be a successful entrepreneur, and I believe that, then I would have never become a successful entrepreneur. But I chose to say, you know what? It was a lesson. There's lessons in this. What were they? I identified those lessons. I applied them to my next business, and it, it took off. It did really, really well. So I think if you're, if you're letting one failure, or even 10 failures, define your future, you won't succeed. I think that one of the big differences between the people who don't succeed and the people who do is just time. They're just consistent. They just keep going when most people quit. Take like, you guys are young, YouTube, right? Think of the people who become successful on YouTube. They don't post three videos and then blow up and have 10 million subscribers. Look at Mr. Beast, for example. Like the guy's first 100 videos were horrible and he had nothing. But he just, he failed, he learned, he took some information, he applied it, he studied videos for years and years and years. Now he has a hundred and something million subscribers, right? But I think the point here is that most people give up when it gets tough. The people who succeed push through that point. And sometimes it takes years. But if one failure causes you to quit, you're probably not going to be successful, right? That's maybe entrepreneurship is not for you, but I would encourage you if you really want that, keep pushing through them. It's hard, but you can do it. Ah, it's a good question. Um, this is where I think the education system failed me <laughs> when I was young. I, I did well in school and we really didn't have any guidance counselors at all. Nobody said like, hey, you're good at math or you're good at this. Think about your future. What do you want your day to look like? And for the longest time, I wanted to be a surgeon, but you know, I was kind of led to believe that medical school is for rich people, so I, I didn't do that because we weren't rich. Um, and then I got into engineering because I was good at math and science, and I just did it. And you know, my dad was a he was, had a business degree, and he saw engineers being successful, and he's like, "Hey, go be an engineer. They do really well." So I got into engineering. It was relatively easy for me, but I never actually took the time to decide if. I actually wanted to be an engineer. And I had this idea of what engineering was. And I remember I graduated and I started <laughs> where Dr. Lamb and I worked. And my first day, I just sat in a cubicle and I looked over and there was a guy like 60 something years old sitting in the same cube that I was and he had been there for 40 years. And I thought, what did I do? Like, I, I can't imagine I'm gonna do this. So I never really liked school when I was in it. I just did it because I thought I had to do it. Um, and eventually, once I graduated and I sat in that cubicle and I looked over, I just knew I couldn't do that for the rest of my life. And I knew that I wanted to change. And for me, it was pretty instant. I, I just said, you know what? I'm not staying here. I'm not doing this. So I remember I went into the office late one night and I took a piece of paper and I just wrote out everything I knew about business. And it was very naive. It was like my aunt worked for a lawyer. So I'm like, oh, I got the legal stuff figured out. And which, you know, it was nothing. He was like a, an estate attorney. He had nothing to do with business, right? But I just like, oh, got a lawyer. I know how to market, you know, and I didn't know anything. But the point is, is I started and I, I just said, okay, I, I know this. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn this. And I hit a hundred walls. But every, like I said, you just hit the hurdles, keep trying to get over them. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was a path for me. And like I said, when I talked at the entrepreneur, uh, uh, entrepreneur conference with Dr. Lamb, I think if you're, if you're considering entrepreneurship, my advice would, would be just do it for a year, right? Go through it because being an entrepreneur is this continual process of learning, hitting hurdles, and trying to put out fires. 
if you like that kind of thing, then you should be an entrepreneur. But if you do it and you're like, God, this is terrible. I don't like this. I just want to go to my job at nine in the morning, come home at five and watch TV. Entrepreneurship is probably not for you, right? It's, it's a long path. But like I said, if it, if it works out and you're consistent, the payoffs can be, can be huge. They'll be very good. So that's confirmation bias, right? That, that's the bias. So I believe um, red M&Ms are the best, right? So I'm going to look for every piece of information in the world that proves my point that red M&Ms are the best. So that's a bias. And I think the best way to avoid that bias is to, one, understand that it exists. And then when you're collecting information or you're trying to filter your information, you know, understand what your original belief is. And maybe separate the, the information by category. This supports my belief. This supports my belief. This supports my belief. And this doesn't support my belief. And if you're just throwing away all the stuff that doesn't support your belief, that would be a good indication that you're, you know, you're a victim of confirmation bias. So one good way to um, avoid that, in my opinion, would just be to talk with people specifically who disagree with you. So if somebody really believes that blue M&Ms are the best, ask them why. Talk about it. Try to figure it out. And again, this is a simple example. But if you're doing a, you're, you're a professor, you're doing a report, and you say, oh, this data is what I believe and it's what it is, find the person who thinks the exact opposite. And then have a conversation with them and really try to understand their point. Why do you think that? I think if you keep open and with that idea in mind, you, you can prevent that the best you can. Now, we're human, right? They're still going to creep in. But I think you got to try to be willing to hear the other side with an open mind.